Steve Berthume, the host of ESPN's Baseball Tonight, is joining us. You'd like that story, wouldn't you, Steve? Bruce, that'd be great, man. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great when the local guys make good. I'm getting down to uh, LSU, actually, tomorrow to do some Super Regionals. we got a, we got wall-to-wall coverage on ESPN and ESPN2 and ESPNU. I'll be doing... Uh, Stony Brook and LSU over the weekend from Baton Rouge. You know, it's funny. Uh, we just had a caller before we, we welcomed you on the show. It's tough enough to predict the NBA draft, let alone the NFL draft, but heavens, heavens no, baseball's impossible. It's funny, isn't it? Everybody thought Appel was going to be number one. Uh, it, guys drop for different reasons, and, and as you know from talking to scouts and people that evaluate talent, it's very, very subjective, especially when some of the kids are high school kids and you try to project who they'll be. And uh, this guy will be a number five starter. This guy might be a number one. This guy will be, he's a shortstop, but we project him as an outfielder. There's so many different ways to interpret what you're seeing out there. And uh, I think that really shows up in baseball. And uh, it just tells you how hard the game is, Bruce. I mean, there's no other sport where you, you would draft a guy number one overall in the draft and might not see him at the major league level for three years. I mean, right. The apprenticeship is so long, and it's such a difficult and specialized skill set. And uh, I think baseball people appreciate that, and people that watch baseball appreciate that. Yeah, and it's one thing when you pay your dues and you work your way through the ranks to make it to the majors. It's another thing to stay in the majors. Oh, boy, isn't it? I mean, look at some of these guys that are struggling right now. I mean, look, Johnny Damon's hanging on, hitting a, hitting a buck 80, trying to get another year or two in there. And then we've seen Lonnie Chisenhall in Cleveland go up and down a little bit. And, uh, you know, Justin Masterson struggled a bit after being so dominant last year. A lot of guys. It's a, it's a funny game, man. It's, that's what makes it great. I said before we started this road trip against Detroit, I took a look at our schedule, and this includes the All-Star break, and, and a week, uh, uh, a couple of weeks after the All-Star break, I said to our fans, Steve, that these next seven and a half weeks will determine our fate uh, for the entire season. And then I took it a step further, and uh, we took a look at the White Sox and the Tigers' schedules, and they're not quite, at least on paper, every major league uh, team is dangerous kansas city san diego i don't care who you're talking about but uh, it, not quite at least on paper is tough but still very formidable these next seven and a half weeks at least in our division i think will determine it i, I think it's going to be very close i think you can win this division with 88 wins maybe even 86 so I don't think anyone's going to run away with it, and we've seen that the Tigers aren't going to do that because their pitching hasn't come around, and they've basically been a two-headed monster offensively and very little else, and now they're starting to have injury problems. Avila's hurt now. Uh, I, I, don't, I think it's going to be tight either way. I, I don't think anyone is going to run away with it. I, I think the surprise for me in the division is obviously the White Sox, and that Kenny Williams got blasted over the winter when he just basically gave Sergio Santos away to Toronto and made some other moves. People thought, well, what's he doing? Well, Kenny Williams knew, and I think we're all finding out now, that the White Sox have a lot more pitching than anybody figured they did. And, I, and boy, I watched Chris Sale. Chris Sale's oh. having the year that everyone thought Matt Moore would have. Right. And, and Moore and Sale dueled in Tampa last week, and, and you know, they combined to strike out 25 guys. That, to me, has been the big surprise. And it's they have way more pitching. Some very live arms at the back end of that bullpen with that and Reed now settled into the closer's role. Uh, the White Sox aren't going away with that uh, with that pitching, especially with the way PV's going. And the Tigers are, are, are very good and can be good if they get more consistent. I think the problem with the Tigers is they have guys that are just very streaky in their rotation. Usually we see guys offensively are streaky, Bruce, but guys like Max Scherzer and Rick Porcello, they can be very good one month and they can be terrible the next month. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that. And when you combine that with Doug Fister missing another month in that rotation, I think that's been their biggest problem. And most of those bats, the Brennan Bosch types, those guys will come around. They'll hit eventually. But I think the lack of consistency in that rotation is what's bit the Tigers so far. And you have to figure sooner or later Scherzer and Porcello will have that month where they're solid or good or very good, and the Tigers will come back up a little bit. I, I agree with you about the White Sox, and, and, and PV is such a key sale, of course. Uh, you, and I didn't, couldn't understand what they were doing. They flipped them back to, you know, they were uh, desperate for a closer. They put them in the pen, then promptly they put them back in the rotation, which is the right move. But PV is such a key for them. He's looking like the PV that won the Cy Young with San Diego. As far as your statements about the Tigers, a couple things about them I want you to respond to, Steve. Sure. 
Yeah. One is their defense, in my opinion, is very, very, very suspect. And the first three game series we had them here in Cleveland, which we swept, we beat them because they played poor defense. We played excellent defense. And the other factor is, except for Cabrera and Fielder, there's no, you know, there's no complimenting in that lineup. There's nobody else so far, at least for Leland, that can hurt you. If you can avoid letting those two guys beat you, you can pitch around them and, and stay in the game. I agree. The defense, Bruce, I think defense is oftentimes more subjective with baseball teams, and I don't think the Tigers know who they are yet, and I think one of the areas where you see that on baseball fields is, is defensively. They thought they were going to have a certain identity. Everyone did. Uh, and they haven't had that. They haven't been that team yet. So I think when you're still trying to figure out who you are as a group, uh, you have some poor defensive efforts. That's where that kind of shows up because it's in the back of everyone's mind. But in terms of the lineup, uh, you know, everyone thought Brennan Bosch. Well, with those guys behind Brennan Bosch, they'll put him in the two hole. He'll hit 320 with 25 home runs. Well, that hasn't happened. Everybody just presumed that it would. I was one of them. I thought he'd have a great year. He hasn't done that yet. The, the, the corner guy, and Delman Young has had his off field troubles. We know about that this right. year. Because he can be a very, very productive bat. Those two guys, to me, are, are, are what's really hurting the Tigers right now. And we found out last year when we watched Alex Avila catch every day until he basically dropped. Um, you look at his numbers going into the postseason the last month, the poor guy could barely stand up. I mean, they, they got nothing out of him offensively because he caught every game, day after day after day. He was in the lineup. It was remarkable. So for me, offensively, those three guys are, are what's really hurting the Tigers. They could easily turn it around. They could both have big second halves. Porcello could get some confidence back in that sinker. Scherzer's been very good lately, 4-0 in his last five starts. There's definitely room for that team to turn it around. And you know we saw last year when Dabrowski went out and got Doug Fistry, went out and added Delman and young. He's willing to add pieces. And when Mike Illett spent all that money to get Prince Fielder, they're not going to come this close and not spend that little bit more just to make sure that they get where they're trying to go. So I would anticipate them making a move like they did last year, too. So I think there's a lot of factors that, that, that will improve the Tigers. If we don't make a move before the deadline to get a bat, I see Quinton may be available now, and heaven knows oh, yeah. he's really hot with San Diego. But Oh, he's killing it. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't make a move to get a bat, uh, I have said our formula to win is it all starts with the starting pitching. They've got to get Manny acted to the sixth or seventh inning and then turn it over to this great pen that we have with solid defense because if they turn it over any more than two runs down, we just don't have the lineup to play that kind of catch up late in the game. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. You definitely need a bat preferably an outfield bat. I, yeah, I think you're right on the money with Quentin. He'd be a tremendous addition. He's killing the ball right now as a Padre. He's a legit long ball threat, and we know what Petco Park is like. That is not a place to hit home runs in. Quentin hit two last night. He'd be a great addition. But like I said before, I think you can win this division with 88, maybe even 86 wins. And if you, the Tampa Bay Rays are playing this style. If you can win the AL East playing the way the Rays do, and I think the Rays will win that division, you can certainly play that way and win the AL Central. Where the, where the high water mark may be a bit lower than it would in the AL East, Cleveland can win that way. Adding a bat will certainly help, uh, but you, you can't have Masterson and Abaldo and Tomlin all with ERAs at five and a half. I mean, that's got to get fixed, and you need so you need a little bit more consistency there, and you need one more bat. And I think the Indians can definitely win the division, no question. Do you see Baltimore lasting in the East? You know, I, I talk to Buck a lot because, you know, obviously he worked on the show with us for a couple of years now, and he's told me time and time again, we're going to be as good as our young pitchers are, and, and that's it. And they just can't get that group together and keep them all healthy and successful at one time. I mean, Jake Arrieta had a terrific first five, six weeks of the season. He was really good. He's been terrible the last few starts. Uh, Mattis, whose whole season last year was a washout, they were worried about his career because the velocity was way down and he didn't know where he was. He's come back just as Arietta has sort of regressed now. And then you've got Britton, who is so good with that dominant sinker ball. He's, you know, he got hurt, then he's in the minor leagues. He's coming back. They can't have Bergeson going. They just can't get that group together for, for you know, even six months at a time. It'd be terrific. But, boy, how about Wei Yin Chen? He's been one of the real yeah. under-the-radar acquisitions. I mean, he's been a terrific pitcher for them. Hamill's done a great job coming over from uh, Colorado. But I, I just... 
I just don't see how they can maintain it because they just can't get more than one guy in that rotation going at any one time. And that, to me, is what's killing them because they hit enough. They've hit just enough to contend. They've gotten enough out of Chris Davis, who's moved up a notch a little bit. The strikeouts are down. He's become a more productive hitter. And Adam Jones is having an MVP-type season, although he's got a bad wrist right now. But I, I just can't see them maintaining this because they can't get that rotation to all click at the same time. I thought Texas would be many more games in front of the Angels than they are right now. And, you know, <laughs> that's a fascinating – and Pujol still hasn't taken off. I mean, they're scary because of that pitching staff. But um, your thoughts there? I, you know, I, I, everything – for the Angels went as badly as it possibly could yes, have. Yes, yes. And, and I, but I, I'm not even trying to be a smart alecky about it. That, that, I mean, everything. They got off to as poor a start as you can possibly have. I mean, there was stories about Tory Hunter and Mike Sosha having these arguments in the clubhouse, and Pujols is, was hitting a buck fifty with one home run, and this and that, and, and they pulled a closer out of uh, Jordan Walden after he blew two save chances, and he's out already, and oh, they're a mess, and Dan Heron can't win a game, and Irvin Santana's getting pounded, and what's going on? Well, and they were awful for six weeks, and they're only, what are they, four and a half, three and a half back right four now? Four and a half back on yeah. tonight, yeah. I mean, think about <laughs> that. I mean, and and, and as, as you guys saw in Cleveland last year, I don't have to tell you what 30 and 15 meant last year to the right, Indians for right. and after that. Ugh. So storylines change so dramatically in this game. It's another thing that makes it so great. And if the Angels can hang in and have everything go terribly wrong, as wrong as it did, and still be within five games of a team that's as good as the Rangers, which everybody concedes is the best team in baseball, uh, that says a lot to me about the Angels and where they are. And, and you watch them now, boy, Nomar garcia Parr did, a, did the Angels-Yankees game last week, and then he came to Bristol and did some baseball tonight over the weekend with me, and he said, boy, I, I saw a video of Mike Trout, and I saw this and that, and I read that, and then I went to see him play. Holy Toledo. Nomar was just raving about what it's like to watch that guy run the bases yeah. and track down balls in the outfield. He is Mickey Mantle. Yeah, and Trumbo, I mean, it, Trumbo's oh. the hottest guy in the major leagues right now. And, and you know what? All the stat guys, Bruce, they said, ah, Trumbo, you can't, he can't be rookie of the year. He doesn't walk. He doesn't get on base. <laughs> Oh, who cares? He's hitting two home runs a night. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, he's leaving, he let him in home runs and RBIs, and he said, well, what about Trumbo as Rookie of the Year? And, uh, and all the stat people went, oh, no, he's not. He doesn't walk enough. Oh, come on, man. Steve, I find the National East to be fascinating this year, too, not only because Santana seems to be back. Uh, certainly, uh, the Miami made a lot of noise at the winter meetings. Uh, they have a very good pitching staff. Uh, certainly, in that wash. Washington is kind of like Baltimore. Are they for real? Will they stay? But Philadelphia should be more than five games out without Halliday, without Howard, without Utley. Your thoughts on that division? Yeah, Bruce, boy, they've hung in. I, I, I think the Phillies are going to be bad, and they're going to be bad for a long time because those guys, they're a, they're a middle-aged team with big contracts. There's not a whole lot in that, in that farm system right now. Guys are breaking down. We've seen Halliday have some injury issues. Cliff Lee's been terrific. He just can't buy a win, the poor guy. I know. Uh, because you can't win with zero. I mean, you can't win with zero. You have right. to find some offense somewhere. And, you know, they've... they've They've gotten some productions from some some pretty good guys. I mean, Carlos Ruiz was hitting 381 last week. Holy Toledo. And Freddie Galvis is doing a good job. There, there's been a negligible difference between what you would have had from Chase Utley and what you've gotten from Freddie Galvis. I, I really don't see that they've dropped down a whole lot, given Utley's condition with his knees, a condition that's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse and has to be managed. So I think the Phillies are, are in trouble here. But I, I really like that division. Who, who would have thought the Mets would be the plucky underdogs? Yeah. I mean, they're fun to watch, man. I mean, they're a bunch of no-name guys, and they're out there. And they're banging into. I mean, they just kicked the ball over the all over the infield last night. They looked terrible defensively, and they cost themselves a, a win. But they're an interesting team. I, I I love the Nationals. I think they've they they get Morse back just as they lose Jason Worth, so that helps them out. But you worry about the 160 innings cap on Strasburg and what that means for the right. rest of the team. Good point. That's a good bullpen. Drew Store and their closer should be coming back anytime soon. They haven't. They've played the whole season without their closer. It's just about every team in the league has. Uh, they got him coming back. Morse is back in the lineup now. They do have some rotation depth there. Detweiler has struggled, so they have Chin Ming Wong. He can go to the bullpen now. They've got Sean Lannon down in the minor leagues. I mean, that's real depth right there. I mean, if you need a body for, say, two, three weeks, they have that guy they can plug in there in that rotation and do it. So uh, the Nationals are not going away, even with the Strasburg cap, because that, that's a. 
that's a pretty good rotation. The team that I, I worry about is the Braves, Bruce. I, I, I would have loved to have picked Atlanta for that division because their offense is tremendous, but I, I don't trust that rotation. Um, you're not going to get a, a shutout every night from Tim Hudson like we saw last night. Right. Jair Jurgens is down in the minor leagues, kind of pouting. Mike Miner's been dreadful. They sent Randall Delgado to the minors to stretch him out so he can come back and take Miner's rotation spot. Uh, to me, that Atlanta rotation has tons of questions. So I, I, I picked the Marlins at the beginning of the year, and I'll stay with that because I, I think they're sort of the dog with the least fleas, as Gordon <laughs> Gecko might say. That's a sexy pick. Uh, I, well, I, you know, I was one of these idiots that bought into the idea that Carlos Zambrano would have a resurgent season, and, I, yeah. and so far he has. Oh, yeah. He's a serviceable guy. And, hey, Absolutely. You get, you get 10, 12 wins out of Carlos Zambrano as your number four or five guy, yeah. you're going to win that division. Before I let you go, Steve, we mentioned Santana, and uh, obviously Beltran's ball hit the chalk. If indeed you are in favor of expanded replay, to what degree? I am in favor of expanded replay, but only on inanimate objects. And, and by that, I mean only when no player is moving. If you, you've, you've got it with the home runs, now let's do the fair and foul lines, and that's it. Let's leave, let's leave the safer out calls on the bases up to the umpires. I don't want instant replay on that. I don't want to be looking at every close play at first or close turn at second base. No, I, I'm never going to give you balls and strikes, but I'll give you the home run lines. I'll give you the foul lines. That's just smart. It's easy. It's quick. You can do it in 30 seconds, bang, and look, much like the NHL does it. The NHL, to me, has a tremendous replay system. It's effective. It works. Bang, you're done over 30 seconds a minute, and we move on. I, I, I really would like it for the home runs and the foul lines, but Nothing on the bases and nothing with balls and strikes ever. Glad to hear you're old-fashioned like me. Uh, well, I get accused of being an old grumpy guy all the time, so I said <laughs> right in. Check out Steve on ESPN Baseball tonight. Thanks so much, Steve. We'll have you back. Great, Bruce. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Steve.